All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Friendship with God Fellowship on this last Sunday before Thanksgiving. So quit thinking about food for a minute because I know you're probably thinking about that. And let's think about the spiritual food. Okay, food's good, but spiritual food, okay. All right, well, let's all stand. Let's start our evening tonight with some music, singing to the Lord. What if it were today? It's a good question.
the sky. I like the way that sounds. Build the sky. Thank you all for being here. How many is your first time to Friendship with God services? Amen. One, two, three, four, five. Wow, we got a. It's not your first time, Jason. All right. <laughs> so we have some uh, uh, cards there. If you keep your hands up, lifted up there, uh, Mr. Jeff is going to get you a card. Thank you so much. We'd like to uh, get a record of your uh, visit and just like to be able to stay connected with you all. Thank you so much for being here. If you have a bulletin, they, they're hot off the press. Amen. And uh, literally, literally right off the press. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. By the way, tonight's food was absolutely awesome. I'm not just saying that. Amen. So I just want to. That, that, that was a divine meal. And I, I'm serious. I like chili rianos, but a chili riano casserole that was sent from above <laughs> with pounds and pounds of cheese on it. And when you're from Wisconsin, that is a plus. Amen. So I just want to thank God for the, uh, the food ministry. Thank you for all the, uh, all the food that you guys bring. And, and uh, so next week will be a potluck. So bring leftovers from Thanksgiving meal. Amen. <laughs> all right. That'll be great next week. So uh, just go ahead and bring in as a be potluck. So feel free. To, if there's no sign-up sheet, just come on and just bring it in next week. That'll be great. Now, 6.30 Thursday nights right here. We've already had our uh, first two courses on, on Jewish on evangelism and with a little bit of Jewish evangelism, which I'm doing here. We're doing this on Thursday nights. It is exciting, guys. If, if you don't have anything more important going on on Thursday night, this is a great place to be at 630 because we're going through evangelism, like biblical evangelism, like how Jesus won people to the Lord. And we go through it biblically. And it's phenomenal. I encourage you to come out. There's still time to come out. And of course, not this Thursday, because why? Thanksgiving. So we'll be coming back on the 30th, the following Thursday. So please jump in. We're going to be talking about uh, Hanukkah and different uh, uh, outreaches to get involved with. It's going to be it's going to be great. So look forward to seeing you there. All right. Upcoming events. Christmas Under the Stars, Saturday, December 9th from 3 to 9. And of course, in February is our Jewish Evangelism Conference, which will be all about Jewish evangelism, February 9th and 10th. Amen? I don't know about you, but guys, I am so excited. We have so many great things going on. Uh, we have Israel Alive. And uh, if you, how many would love to go to Israel? And, and how many have never been to Israel and love to go? There's a lot of hands in here. We're, right now, we have 78 people that have signed up to go to Israel through our ministry. We are going to be providing outreach trips to actually reach Israelis, to love on them, build relationships with them. Amen. 
And so if you want to know more about that, see me afterwards, and that will add you to the growing list. And, uh, and so we're excited. Uh, we're already planning our, our trips in, uh, this next year. So you want to make sure you get to a, get a be a part of that, all right? So now, if you would like to continue your giving through uh, or your worship of the Lord through giving, through uh, your tithe, uh, we don't pass the plates. For some of you that are new here, we don't pass the plates around, but we do have a box at the very end, which is scriptural. Uh, we won't preach on that right now. But uh, if you would like to bring your tithe or your offering, whatnot, your donation, donations for the food ministry, whatnot, thank you so much for being here. We, uh, we offer that to you. Let's go ahead and pray, and let's ask the Lord for his presence. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for assembling us here tonight. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a miracle that we're all here in, in many ways. And thank you, Lord, for the great food, the great fellowship, and we do not take it for granted. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness, for your mercy, your grace upon our lives, upon this, uh, this church meeting. And we ask for your presence. We ask for your hedge of protection around this place, Lord. We ask that you would bind the enemy off the airwaves, off uh, anyone that's watching uh, uh, live stream, Father, we pray that you would touch hearts all across the world that are watching this tonight, and may we hear from you. May we hear from the Word of God. May you bless our, our Bible teacher, Brother Cantor, and may you bless us with your presence. Help us to leave changed in some way for the glory of God. Well, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain seated, and we'll have one more song here. Welcome our Bible teacher, Mr. Tom Cantor. Oh, yeah. So that was such a great song. Forget about what I was going to preach on. I'm going <laughs> to preach on that song. That was just a wonderful song. Thy word is like a garden, Lord. And, uh, and that's, but instead of preaching on that, we'll just go to the word. How about, how about that? And we'll pick, pick a lovely cluster there. <laughs> and we'll, we'll find for life's battle everything we need to fight the battles of the Lord. And so let's do that now. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth that that hymn just expressed of how, Lord, your word is so lovely. It's so needed. It's so guiding to us. And so, Lord, we do pray tonight that your word would be all those things to us. And that, Lord, as we, as we look into your word, it wouldn't just be reading the Bible. It wouldn't just be learning the Bible, but it would be seeing the face of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you turn in your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, we're going to continue on in the gospel according to Moses. Moses. Not, not who was the other? Forget it. Anyway, so we're going to continue on in this wonderful book 
here uh, of the gospel according to Moses in Exodus, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 15, and um, we're coming right from the Red Sea here now. We start in verse 22, Exodus 15, 22, 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. So we got the scene now. We're coming from the Red Sea. And they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Marah means bitter in Hebrew. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute, an ordinance. There he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, will do that which is right in his sight, will give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where, where, where were twelve wells of water, three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Okay, so we're walking with Israel. Israel is walking with God. This is a journey with God. It's going to last 40 years. It's just beginning now. It started, the journey started when they were back in Egypt, when on that last night in Egypt, what a night that was. It was a night of death and salvation. It was called the Passover. And the Passover was where God showed to Israel. They never could have figured this out on their own. But he showed to them that they needed blood. They, every family had to have blood. The blood of a sacrifice, the blood of a lamb, that was collected when the lamb was killed. All the families killed their, their lambs at the same time. They collected in a bowl. Can you imagine this? I mean, we're probably talking about in the in the, around 750,000 lambs all being killed at the same time in Israel. All the blood is collected at the same time. Every one of those families, this is the smart ones at least, every one of those families who, who then took the, the, the hyssop and went to their doorpost and splashed the blood on the top and on the side that they, they all had bloody doors. And what happened is that the angel of death came over and God said, when I see the blood, I will skip you. I will exempt you. I will pass over you. I will Pesach. And, 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 and that was the beginning of their journey. And so you can see that in Israel, when that happened, what happened? They all took out their notepads and they said, start writing and make sure you got a lot of pages in that notepad because you're going to need them on these 40 years here. And that, was the, that lesson was, we need blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. All right, so we got the first lesson down there. That was the Passover night. That's what happened at that time. And that was illustrating salvation. And then they start on this journey. It's a journey with God. They are not alone out there in the wilderness. Every step of the way, God is with them. And that's like our life, our life with God after we're being saved. And Israel saw when they came to the Red Sea, as we have seen already, when they came to the Red Sea, first of all, God led them into a trap. He led them to the edge of the Red Sea. And if one of the other said to the other one, you know, hey, Jaime, how'd we get here? He'd say, we were led here. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah. They were led to being trapped. And in that position of being trapped, then they were, they were jumping up and down, and, they, and, and, and Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Okay, get your notebook out and write the second lesson. I'm to stand still and see the salvation of God when there's nothing that I can do. And then God opened up the Red Sea. And the Red Sea was with the tremendous east, the, with tremendous wind blew, dried everything out. They walked on dry ground in the middle of the Red Sea, and they crossed over the other side. The Red Sea came down, collapsed on their enemies, destroyed their enemies, their Egyptian enemies, totally wiped them out. They stood on the shore, and Moses could not refrain himself as the dead bodies, the dead Egyptian bodies washed up on the shore. Moses sang a song called the Song of Moses, and then it's going to be sung again in the book of Revelation. 
And Miriam, his sister, she couldn't refrain herself. She grabs a timbrel, timbrel and she starts going around and she sings a song, the song of Miriam. So what happened at that point is that, okay, get your notebooks out, write down, God destroys our enemies. Okay, but then you can imagine how what happens with the people. They're sitting there they're looking at the dead bodies and they're going, not bad, not bad. We are pretty important. We're pretty hot stuff. Look what he just did to the strongest army on the earth here. With such a God like this, we're going to have all of our needs. So this began pride. Pride came in. And so now, throughout this whole 40 years, this is all going to be a constant humbling process. And when Moses looks back in the book of Deuteronomy, the last of his five books, and in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, Moses gives a summary statement. And now they've got a whole notebook of all kinds of lessons they've learned. And in the back, now Moses says, okay, now I want you to, as you look back over all the lessons you've learned over these 40 years, I want to now give you the take-home message, the takeaway message, the summary. And he says that in Deuteronomy 8.2 when Moses says, And thou shalt remember all the way that the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. And so now they say, no, oh, yeah, we got to, let's think back on this. It's been 40 years, yeah, it's been 40 years. All the way, what has it been? And here's what he said. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee. That's what it was all about, to humble thee. And that is the biggest problem in our lives. Pride and arrogancy is the cancer of the soul. And God is constantly humbling as he did Israel on their 40-year journey, so he's doing with us. He's constantly working on this problem of, of, the, of the cancer of our soul. He's humbling us. It's God's chemotherapy. So Israel was humbled when they had no bread, as we saw. Because, and the, and the, the crowning part of that was that God could have put that fruit on the trees. Well, let's see. We'll get an apple here and an orange here. Okay, fine. This is all my level here. But God said, no, I'm not going to put that bread on the trees. It's going on the ground, and you're going to have to get on your knees every day to collect that bread. And that was all about the humbling as well. As well. And that's, a, that's what he said. That was his design, a very important design of the manna when he said further in Deuteronomy 8, verse 16 now. Deuteronomy 8, 16, when he said, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee. So it's this continual process. And then we saw that Israel found war with Amalek. All of a sudden, this, uh, this, 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 this unknown people, Amalek was attacking, and the people said, What's an Amalek? And they, and they found out this was a continual battle that happened in the days of Moses, in the days of Joshua, in the days of Saul, in the days of Samuel, in the days of David, and today only they're called Palestinians. And what they did is that, as the Palestinians are trying to do now, making tunnels under the wall in Israel to come up in kindergartens in Israel to kill the, ki the children... The weakest ones, that was Amalek's history when it always was attacking from the rear the weak and the feeble who lagged behind. And so there was this continual war with Amalek. And this showed to us, this was a picture of what our flesh is within us, always attacking us when we're weak, when, we're, when we're, we don't feel strong, and the flesh rises up continually against us. And so today I'm going to speak on healing, but it's not what you're thinking. I'm not going to speak on the healing of the body. Why? Because the soul is more important than the body. And the sickness of the body is only an illustration for the sickness of the soul. I mean, I'm not saying the sickness of the body is, is not important. Believe me, I know. But our soul's diseases are more important than our body's diseases. And this brings us to the illustration of what he taught them. Again, getting their notebooks out so they could learn at Mara in verse 22, where it says, So Moses brought, Israel, uh, uh, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, Israel, it says they were wandering. Everybody says they were wandering in the desert for, three, for 40 years. They weren't wandering. They were being led. They were being led by God constantly. Of course, if you looked at the, the, the course that they were traveling, it looks like they were wandering. But... But they weren't. They were being led by God. 
just as they were led by God to the Red Sea, Moses, under the direction of God, led the people. He brought them. He brought them from a great victory where they had such exhilaration. There was such a step in the, as they walked, as they thought were invincible, indestructible. And God said, okay, they need humbling. So it, they brought, he, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And he brought them down to a place of the wilderness of Shur. Not quite sure exactly where this is, but Shur means wall in Hebrew. So they were in a place, again, where they were like walled in, very similar to what happened at the Red Sea. And they were marching on for three days. And all during this time, they're drinking the last water that they have in their water skins that they brought from Egypt. So it's getting lower and lower. It's beginning to run out. And they're saying to each other, we better find some water pretty soon. We're going to be in deep, deep trouble. And their mouths become dry. And their, their, their animals start to suffer from the lack of water. And, and in verse 22, it's very important when it says, they found no water. Verse 22 says, they found no water. What does that show you? They're looking for water. And they found no water. I, it reminds me when I, when I was 15 and, and I was part of a group, uh, I went to Colorado Rocky Mountain School. This was one of the places where my father sent me to try to straighten me out. I was the only Jewish kid there. And I was totally out of place. And <clears throat> because this was a place where you, you get whipped into shape and you climb a mountain every weekend and you have all these intensive studies and it was no place for a Jewish boy to be, believe me. And, <clears throat> and so, you know, we climbed, uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the name of this terrible mountain. First mountain, it was 10,000 feet. It wasn't that tall. But when I got to the top, I said, you got to call the helicopter for me. I, I can't make it back down, you know. <laughs> well, eventually I did and then... And, you know, we eventually, we, we climbed Mount Castle, which was 14,250 feet. Saw Robert Kennedy's signature up there. That was kind of nice. But anyway, so it was, I know, you can't believe that. I was half the person I am now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tom, he's hiking. Never mind. So but we were hiking, hiking, hiking all during the summer there. And then for the finale, we, we half the group, about 200 of us, half the group, 100 and 100, we divide up into half and half. And one half came down by trucks into the Four Corners region. Anybody know where the Four Corners region is? Okay, a lot of people do. Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Right there, there's a Navajo, res Rainbow National Park. There's a Navajo reservation there. And it was summertime, and it gets really, really hot. And so the trucks came down with half the kids who were 100, and they parked at the Navajo um, store, the 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 the, the Anyway, the store there. And then we came up on rafts up, to, up, through, up through Glen Canyon. Uh, and, and we came up on rafts, and we parked our rafts. And it was so very hot that we had all, it was all planned out that, that we would both come here and come here in late afternoon. And we would make the cross in the hardest part of the desert at night. And we were going to do this. We would meet each other, and we would take their trucks, and they would take our rafts. That was the plan. And only the thing is, is that they started out in, in, you know, not so bad terrain. We started out in just like quicksand. It was sand. And we have our hiking boots on. We've been climbing mountains all summer. And we go, what is this? And we can't walk. And it's starting to hurt the back of our legs. And, and all of a sudden, it gets dark and dark and dark. And it was canyoned and there was no light. And so we were supposed to do this, but we did this. And we ended up right in the middle of the hottest canyon desert where the temperatures were approaching 140 during the day. And one of the girls went into convulsions, almost died. And we, didn't, we said, why should we bring water? Because, you know, we're just going to be overnight and then we'll get there. So we didn't have any water. That was a real problem. And so it was on the news that the Civil Air Patrol was looking for us. We were down in the canyons. They couldn't see us. And it, and it was on Huntley Brinkley, and my father was just thrilled to see that about what his son had done. And I was saying to myself, I told you no Jewish boy should be here. But anyway, so we were there, and, um, and then the, they, they said, the, 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 the counselor said, okay, we're looking for some volunteers who would like to quick walk out of here and come for, go get help. So I volunteered, and there were about seven or eight others. I know you can't believe that, but it was true. And... And so we, we st just started walking, you know, and walking and walking and walking. It was so hot. And we would come up to one uh, kind of like small hill, and we were expecting, now we're going to see the, the reservation camp. 
the reservation store. But no, it was just another hill. I just remember it was one hill after the other, and I thought, is this ever going to stop? And we would just go up, and then we'd go down, and we'd up, and oh, no, I can't do it, down and up. And we went, up, oh, finally, we, finally, I didn't die, by the way, <coughs> in case you didn't know that. But we were looking, we're looking, looking, because we needed water. That's the way it was in verse 22, when it says they found no water. And then, if, finally, I want you to, to picture this now. When they finally come up to this, the, the place where they can see, and all of a sudden they see water. They see a river. They see beautiful water. It's the water of Mara. They haven't reached it yet. What a wonderful sight that was for them. And they thought to themselves, at last, we're going to drink and drink and drink from these waters of Mara. We're so thirsty. Can you picture that? Can you picture those people running towards that water of Mara with so much expectation, so much happiness? And can you, can you feel the crash of verse 23 when it says they could not drink of the waters of Mara for they were bitter? This great disappointment that had happened to them. We can feel this extreme disappointment as they thought that the, now their thirst was going to be satisfied. What a great disappointment this was. And then they realized that this was unavoidable. It was unavoidable. Why? They were following Moses. It's not like they could have said, I told you we should have gone left instead of right back there. I told you we shouldn't have done this. No, that wasn't an option for them. There was no right and left for them. There was only following Moses who was being led by God. It was unavoidable, just like the war with Amalek was unavoidable for them. Coming to the waters of Mara was unavoidable. And, 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 and you, we can hear the people saying, why, why are we here? Why did we come to these poison waters? And maybe some would say, what did I do wrong to end up at Mara? And the answer is, you did nothing wrong. This was all God's teaching. Mara lay right in the path of God's leading. They did nothing wrong. They were being led by God. Just think about the waters of Mara in the case of the Lord Jesus. Very early in his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, we read in Matthew 4, 1, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And maybe he would have said, well, why did this happen to me? No, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. The people were led of the Spirit to the waters of Mara. And it says there that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was a hungry. hungry. I'd be hungry after 40, day, 40 minutes, but he was hungry after 40, 40 days. And, when the, and then it says the tempter came to him in the wilderness, and he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The Lord Jesus was led of the Spirit into that place. And he could have said, why have I been led here to have no bread for 40 days? And sometimes in life, we ask those questions. We ask those same questions. Why did this happen to me? Why, what did I do wrong in life? What should I have done? Why do I have this heart condition? Why do I have this cancer? And just because we have been, we come to bitter waters of Mara, bitter circumstances in life, it doesn't mean that we did anything wrong. Because Mara lay right in the middle of where God was leading them to. And they did nothing wrong. And we can ask, we can ask, we can hear Israel asking, why did God let this happen to me? Why did, God, why did God let me be so disappointed to see these waters and then I can't drink from them? And when we see in verse 22 that it was God who led Israel to Mara, it was God who led them to the disappointment of not finding drinkable water, then we can come to understand that when, God, when, it, when we see that God led them into this disappointment, we come to understand, understand disappointments in life disappointments are God's appointments. Disappointments are God's appointments. I know you don't love to hear that. I don't love to hear it either. But this, because there's so much disappointment that awaits us in life. But God has a purpose. And God's showing Israel that he will never disappoint. And Israel's got to learn. They've got their notebooks out there writing these things down. And when we look at Israel and we see this continual pattern of a high at the Red Sea, 
and then a low at the bitter waters of Marah, and then a high by seeing the waters healed, which we're going to see, and then a low of finding no bread, and then a high of bread raining down from heaven, and then a low of war with Amalek, and then a high of seeing the battle won with Amalek. See, this is constant pattern. Like that. That's life. That's the life that God was leading them into, constantly like that, constantly. An expectation, a disappointment. An expectation, a disappointment. It was continual for Israel in the 40 years. It's continual for us. And this is, how, this is what happens with us. We have such great expectations, such high hopes. Oh, this relationship is going to be one of perfect harmony. Oh, this marriage is going to be a never-ending romance to end all romances. Oh, the home is going to be such a place of peace and restfulness. Oh, my job is going to be the place where I'm going to find absolute fulfillment in life. Oh, the diet and the exercise is going to put me in great health. Oh, the church is going to be perfect. Everybody, I'm going to get along with everybody and agree with everybody. And this administration, they're going to fix all the problems in the government. So much expectations. But it's like the, coming to the waters of Mara. And they came to the waters of Mara, and the relationship ends in a bitter fight. And the marriage either ends in an actual divorce or a virtual divorce where it's just two people enduring each other. And the home has become a war zone of tensions. And the job, oh, the boss at the job has made this absolutely terrible. And the health has got diabetes and health, uh, heart disease and, ca and cancer. And the perfect church is full of people, there are some people there that offend me. And the new administration, what can you say? Promises that are never kept. So this is Mara, and it represents the disappointments that happen. But the, but the real issue here is how to handle the disappointments. And this is where we see what happened when, in verse 24. Because when they came to this problem, it says, the people murmured against Moses. It's all Moses' fault. And they said, what shall we drink? Come on, Moses. It's, Solve this one. So what happened here, unfortunately, was verse 24. It's all Moses' fault. It's all the other person's fault. Oh, it's the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the spouse, the kids that ruined the home, the boss that ruined the job, the environment that I got all these diseases, the, and all these people that offend me, and so forth. And, and it's the cycle of expectations and disappointments, and they go on and on. And the Lord Jesus prepped us for that. When he said in John 16, 33, John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. You shall have tribulation, but it, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So when the people blamed Moses, they sinned. Now it's one thing to have the bitter waters of Mara. It's another thing to have those bitter waters enter in and make a bitterness in the soul. And that's what happened. The bitter waters of Mara infected the people and gave them a bitterness. They didn't have to have it, but that's how it's described in Numbers chapter 21.4. Numbers 21.4, it describes they journeyed from Mount Hor by the, by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people were much discouraged because of the way. That's the description of what happened. The bitter waters infected their soul, so they became much discouraged. They were, inf they, were, they were infected by the bitter waters, by the bitter circumstances of their life. This happened in, in the beginning of the book of Exodus. It opens up that way, Exodus 1.14, where it says that the Egyptians made their lives bitter with hard bondage of mortar, brick, all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them to serve with rigor. See, but God is going to heal the waters of Marah. And God healed the bitterness of their circumstances in Egypt with the whole book of Exodus. When it is, who has a book that's called The Exit? You know, but that's what it is. It's the exit out of Egypt. And, 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 and Naomi Naomi in the book of Ruth, she was infected also with bitterness in her soul because of the bitter waters of the death of her husband and the death of her only two sons and, the reduction, and her reduction down to poverty. And that made her bitter inside. And she, Naomi means pleasant, but she said in, in Ruth 120, Ruth 120, she said unto them, call me not Naomi, don't call me pleasant, 
Call me Mara, call me bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. That was Naomi. But God had a tree that healed her waters. And so what happened was that she got a new wonderful daughter-in-law named Ruth, a new family, and she got a grandson that she nursed. And people said, Naomi had the baby. That was her healing. Hannah was bitter because she had no children. And she described her bitterness in, in 1 Samuel 1.15 as, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit, of a sorrowful spirit. And, 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 but, but God put the tree into her waters and healed her. And it says, in, and, and, and she had a son, Samuel, and not only that son, but in 1 Samuel 2.21, it says the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters, and Samuel grew before the Lord. Mordecai, Mordecai, he, the waters of Mara infected his soul. He was bitter. It says that in Esther 4.1. Esther 4.1, it says, when Mordecai perceived all that Haman had done, Mordecai rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, went out into the midst of the city, and cried with a loud and bitter cry. But God put the tree into his waters also and made them sweet, so that he became the second most powerful man in Persia. And it says in Esther 10.3 that Mordecai the Jew was next to the king Ahasuerus, great among the Jews, accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, speaking peace to all his seed. And Job, oh Job, what can we say about Job? Job says a lot about himself in his book. But Job, he, he was bitter because he lost his family, he lost his wealth, and he lost his health. And he says in Job 7.11, I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And he says in Job 9.18, it says, He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. And Job 10.1, I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. And God put the tree of, of change in his life, and it became sweet. He healed the bitterness. By why? By giving him a new family, greater wealth and even health so that we read at the end of the book in job 42 12 so the lord blessed the latter end of job more than his beginning he had fourteen thousand sheep six thousand camels i can't even imagine one camel much less six thousand camels and six and and, and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses and he also had seven sons and three daughters so what this is showing us is that the bitter events in our lives, they're continual, but they're only temporary. They're continual, they're only temporary. Let's move this from air on, please. They're continual, only temporary. And God's going to overturn them. That's why this chapter is so wonderful, because it ends in Elam. It doesn't stay in Mara. It ends in Elam, which we're going to see is a wonderful place. And, they, and there's an Elam behind every Mara. And there was an Elam for Israel. There was an Elam for Naomi. There was an Elam for Hannah, for Mordecai, for Job. And there's an Elam for us also. So that raises the question, why does God allow the bitter waters of Mara in our lives? And, and we can see a purpose in Paul's life. Paul had his own waters of Mara, a bitterness that he had to endure. And he talked about in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. He, he's really talking about this. He's mentioned it twice now. Lest I should be exalted above measure. So in this thing I besought the Lord thrice that, he would, that it would depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, let me just pause here. And just kind of, so Paul here, first of all, he said, I know the purpose of the Mara. This, this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, he didn't go into details. But he, it was something that, was, that he asked the Lord, take it away, take it away, take it away. And God said, no, no, no. He said, and God said, yeah, I'm giving you my grace, and that's enough for you. It's enough. But I'm going to let you have this messenger of Satan to buffet you, to beat you up, to beat you around continually. And so why was this? What was this? He said it was because of the abundance of the revelations. Oh, Paul, you see things that nobody else sees. Oh, Paul, oh, Paul. And so God says we can't have the oh, Paul. 
we got to have a pin on this bubble. And so God comes along and he gives him the thorn in the flesh. And then he, he, he tells him his grace is sufficient. And then what something happened, wonderful happens to Paul, and that is in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul makes a complete conversion on this issue of the infirmities, a complete reversal. And whereas the other time he was saying, get it away, get it away, get it away, now he totally reverses himself, and he says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. That was a tremendous change for Paul. That was a tremendous reversal. Now, what happened there with Paul? Paul came to a place where he said, I love the acceptance of God's will. I love the acceptance of God's will. That was a total re reverse for him. And that's the key to not letting the bitter waters make our soul bitter. That's the key right there. God has led me to this place of disappointments. Disappointments are God's appointments. He has led me here, and I love to accept where he led me. I love to accept his will. Now, the other purpose that he said uh, that he had for Israel in this when he talked about it Deuteronomy 8 16 is that he he said that he he he, he during his 40 years he proved them he proved them what's that mean it means that these experiences the waters the waters of Mara they brought out what was really in Israel's heart they brought out what was in Israel's heart you know when you get if, if, if let me just say no, when a person gets really irritated and then flies off the handle you know what that is? When you shake the glass, that's what's inside the glass that comes out. And so this is what God wanted to do. He wanted to show them what's really in your heart. I mean, you know, people, we, the, the Laodiceans thought to themselves, we are strong believers. Oh, we are so strong. Look at our works. And, and so, but their hearts were deceived. How can this be that there was such a disconnect between how the Laodiceans saw themselves and how God saw the Laodiceans. How's that possible? But he says, God says in Revelation 3.15, Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, I'll spit, and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Pretty graphic. God's talking about vomit. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. They thought they were spiritually rich. They needed nothing. But God said, no, you're not. How is it? How could they have known the reality of their true state? By the waters of Mara. They could find out by trials. And that was a purpose that God had for Israel. And that's a purpose that God has in our lives. Because it's when we're, when we're really dry and thirsty, that, 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 that brings out a yearning for God. That's what David said in Psalm 63. Psalm 63, 1, David said, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. Because thy love and kindness, it's better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I'll lift up my hands in thy name. Only when he was in a dry and thirsty land where there was no water, like at Mara, that he could then see the glory and the power of God and praise him. When, when the Lord Jesus made his invitation, he said, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me. And, 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 and because whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, in John 4, 14, John 4, 14, that shall never thirst, but though the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
And that's what I was trying to say about John 7, 37. John 7, 37 is when he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And so he, they, God was teaching Israel that where your soul satisfaction comes from is what it says in Psalm 87, 7. Psalm 87, 7. All my springs are in thee. All my springs are in thee. Now, the other reason that God brought them to Marah, according to Deuteronomy 8.16, Deuteronomy 8.16, it says that he brought them to, to humble them to do thee good at thy latter end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Marah was less than 10 miles from Elam. They didn't know that. They didn't know that, but Mara was less than 10 miles from Elam, and Elam was a wonderful place. There were wells of water, cool water, palm trees, green grass. They could stretch out under that grass, which they did, because it says they encamped there. They say, let's just stay here. This is a nice place. But God said, no, we got to move on. Why? Because God gives to us the measure of what he calls in the Bible times of refreshing, times of refreshing. <clears throat> which come from the Lord. And this is all very necessary. But before God brought Israel to Elam, God brought them to Mara for a couple of reasons. One, so they would appreciate Elam, but two, also to see would they have faith and confidence in God's goodness when they were passing through the Mara period. Elam was coming, and the question was, would Israel hold to the conviction God is good. God is going to do me good, even as I go through this thirst at disappointment at Mara. And would Israel really believe that? That God had good plans for them when they were in the, the bitter bondage of Egypt? Would, would, would Naomi, would Hannah, would Mordecai, would Job really believe that when they went through their Mara? That's what faith is. But afterward, when they go through it, you could call it a time of chastening, as it says in Hebrews 12, 11, Hebrews 12, 11. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised. So being led to the bitter waters of Mara was necessary for them. It was necessary for them to be humbled, for them to be, get the pride taken out of them. You know, it reminds me, we, we lived on the goat ranch over there on Willow Road. And I don't know if you know this, but goats have horns. <laughs> And horns are a bad thing. Horns are a bad thing. They gore each other with the horns. They get caught up in the chain link fence. They hang themselves. They hurt themselves. It's just terrible. So, and once a goat has horns, you, you, you should never try to remove the, 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 the horns on a goat. You can write that down. <laughs> Don't ever get a wire saw that they sell and try to cut off the horns of a goat because when you do that, you can look right down into the brain of the goat, and that's not a good thing to be able to see the brain of the goat. So when the goats were young, we would dehorn them and, and, and before their horns came in. And this was when we would make the fire and put in the dehorning iron until it was red hot. And then we would bring this dehorning iron over to the goats and we would burn the top of their horns where the horns boards were going to come in. And that was an ordeal. I mean, it was almost like I wanted to say to the goats, this is going to be harder on me than you. But, oh, the, 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 the smoke and the burning and the screaming uh, that has to go on so that they wouldn't develop horns. It was a very nerve-wracking thing to burn up the horn buds on young goats, but it had to be done. And when God brought Israel to the bitter waters of, of, of Marah, it was like a dehorning. It was painful, but it had to be done to humble them and to bring out what was in their hearts so that they could see it, forsake it, and turn to the Lord. So bringing us to the bitter waters of Mara, God wants to really see if we really believe that God ultimately has an Elam for us. Because behind every Mara is an Elam. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed when, when, I, when I take a, a, you know, an early morning plane ride from San Diego on a typical early morning day in San Diego in May or June. It's gray. It's, it looks terrible. It's like, oh boy, a day like this, you know, the marine layer socked in. The city, it looks really bad. And you think, this is the so. And, and it's the cloud cover. And then the jet takes off, and it pierces through the clouds, and there's this glorious sunshine, and I feel like getting on the phone saying, hey, it's sunny in San Diego. 
it, it, uh, you can't see it. All you need is a jet, you know, <laughs> because Mars are temporary. And elims are, are temporary. Mars and elims, they show us one thing, this up and down, show us, and this is what they were always having to write down in their notebook, and it was Hebrews 13, 14, Hebrews 13, 14. Here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So God brings us times of refreshing, but he let us go through the Mars so that we will learn and get it into our mind. We do not have a continuing city. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. And after Amar, God brings the, 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 the times of refreshing, as I mentioned in Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's what Elam represented. And the question is, how do we respond? The question for Israel, how do you respond to Mara? The question for Moses, how do you respond to Mara? The question for us, how do we respond to Mara? That's what's important. And that's when you sandwich, when you put those two verses together, 24 and 25, you see the two responses, 24 and 25. 24 is the wrong response. The people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? God gave Moses and the people a mouth. And God actually had to go over that lesson with Moses at the burning bush when he said, who made the mouth? But he gave to both the, the Israel and to Moses a mouth. And in verse 24, we see the wrong use of the mouth to complain and to murmur against Moses. But in 25, we see the right response. We see the right use of the mouth, which is Moses. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. See, what's interesting there is when you see how they complained and Moses cried to the Lord. So Moses cries to the Lord, and then God says to Moses, a tree, a tree, go there. Now, was there any way that Moses could have figured that out? Was there any way that the people could have figured out we have to put blood on our doors so we won't be killed, the firstborn won't be killed in Egypt? Is there any way, there was no way for Moses, he could have never figured out that the waters would be made sweet by a tree unless God showed him. God showed him a tree. And can you imagine the people when Moses is saying, well, I, I, see that tree? i got to go cut that tree down and put it in the waters, and the waters will become sweet. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, you really expect us to believe that that little tree is going to make all these bitter waters sweet? Because God brought an unexpected change from bitter to sweet. This was an unexpected change from bitter to sweet. Israel had to be like Moses. Moses trusted and obeyed. Moses heard and did. And that's, what, and, 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 and that's how the waters were made sweet. Israel was going through a land they didn't know. They didn't have maps. They didn't have a GPS. They didn't have the forder's guide for, through the wilderness here. They didn't have any of that. And it was important for them as they went through this journey to constantly be praying the prayer of the hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. And this is an illustration for us as we see this, because we cried out to God in our despair, and he showed us a tree. It was called the cross. He showed us the tree of the cross. Was there any way that we could have figured that out, that a cross is what we needed to save us from our sins and to make our life go from bitter to sweet? God showed Moses a tree. When Abraham was on that mount, Mount Moriah there in Genesis 22, and the angel had stopped him from killing Isaac in verse, 20, verse 12, in Genesis 22, 12, when he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know thou fearest God. And then it says that Mo Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns, thorn, horns. And, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, Abraham was in that same position as Moses. What are we going to do? What shall I do? And Abraham looked, and God showed Abraham, the ram is what you should do. Go offer him in the place of Isaac. And Moses said, what shall I do? And God said, the tree is what you should do. And that tree represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Moses walks over to a 
perfectly good growing tree. And he, and he bends over and he cuts the tree off. And, and that illustrates for us that the Lord Jesus Christ was the tree. The tree didn't look like it was going to heal the waters. The Lord Jesus didn't look like he was going to save anyone, as that was his accusation, save thyself. He, didn't look, he was a root out of a dry ground. It says that in Isaiah 53. It's very graphic in his description. In Isaiah 53, 2, he shall grow up, at, grow up before him as a tender plant, a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Apart from that, he looks like he's the mighty savior. No beauty that anyone should desire him. But there were those who believed God, and they looked on him, and as they looked on him and looked on him, they saw beyond his outward appearance. And when they saw beyond his outward appearance, they saw something that others didn't see, and they saw John 1.14. They saw John 1.14. They saw this was the word that was made flesh. And as we gaze upon him, look on him, we see the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They saw the glory of God. What happened? As they were looking on the Lord Jesus, God was saying, command, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. They saw the glory of God in his face. So the tree is revealed to Moses, just as the cross is revealed to us. Moses goes over to the tree, and, and he cuts it down, just like the Lord Jesus was cut off in Isaiah 53, 8. Isaiah 53, 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who is going to declare his generation? Because he was cut off out of the land of the living. That's what happened to him. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Just like that tree was cut off from the land of the living, the Lord Jesus was cut off. And it says that in Daniel 9.26. Daniel 9.26 says, After three score and ten years shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And this is what Caiaphas said. He didn't even know what he was saying in John 11.49. In John eleven forty nine, 49, Caiaphas was the high priest, and, his, and he being the high priest that same year said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. This spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus sh should die for that nation. One man should die for the people, so that the whole nation perish not. It was a tree. What if the tree could talk? And the tree could say, no, I'm, 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 I'm doing fine over here. Thank you very much. Leave me alone. And the tree, and, but Moses would say, but you need to die so that all of these people here can live. And that's what he was willing to do, the Lord Jesus. He was alone. He was cut off so that we all could live eternally. And we could be healed from our sins and then notice how this wording says in verse 25, a tree which when he had cast, cast it into the water. He cast it into the water, and the tree healed the waters. You know, he didn't like, well, I'll just set it down here and float it out there. I'll just bury it with it. He throws it. Moses throws it. He throws it. The tree healed the waters. The tree healed the waters. And then the Lord said at the end of verse 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. The tree healed the waters, but the Lord said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He's making the connection. That tree is me, is what God is saying. Jehovah Jesus is saying, that tree is me. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And he was cast. He heals our souls. He takes the bitterness of our souls out. He replaces it with sweetness. Sweetness as he gives us the power to repent, to not do those sins that, are, that make it so bad and bitter for us. And as God looks at us, he doesn't see the bitter side of our sins. He sees the sweetness of Christ. He sees us covered with the righteousness of the Lord. And so that's how the Lord makes us, as it says in Ephesians 1, 6, Ephesians 1, 6, he made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Who's the beloved? 
Matthew 17, 5, Matthew 17, 5, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I am well pleased. What changes the bitter to sweet for us is when we love to accept the will of God, the will of God. And the casting there, you can't read a verse like that, that he, the tree was cast in the water to, to think to yourself, that's how people are placed in hell. They're not placed in hell, they're cast into hell. As it says in Matthew 8.12, Matthew 8.12, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer, outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But Isaiah 53.10 speaks about something like a casting when it says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord shall be at his hand. What that's saying, it says, if you take his soul, if you take his soul and make his soul an offering for your guilt, this is a little reading, if you make his soul an offering for, his, for your guilt, then God's going to look at you and he's going to say, that's my seed, that's my child, the one who received me, he shall see his seed. And then God's going to say, give him eternal life, he shall prolong his days. And then he's going to say, make him to do the will of God, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So what we've seen so far is that after the Passover, after that great night of salvation, when the angel of the Lord passed over there and, and they started their journey with God, that Israel had continual needs. And these continual needs were being addressed and met during these 40 years in the wilderness. And after our conversion, we have continual needs. We need to keep our souls nourished daily with the word of God, which was the illustration of the manna. We need to constantly fight the battle against our flesh, which was the illustration of the war with Amalek. And after conversion, we have a continual need for constant healing and cleansing from our sins by coming again and again to the tree, the cross, that makes the bitter sweet and confess our sins to God, as it says in 1 John 1.8. 1 John 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for how you, you brought your people to these bitter waters of, uh, of Mara, Mara. And then, Lord, you showed them a tree. And if they put the cast the tree into the waters, the, trees were, the, the waters were made sweet. The bitter waters were changed. Thank you for doing that in our lives through the cross of the Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Another wonderful teaching tonight. And don't get bitter about that. <laughs> Let's all just uh, stand one last time this evening. Let's have a, a hymn before we greet each other and go out. Jesus, engrave it. Oh.